Welcome back to the Joseph Carlson Show. That is correct. I did make a large sale. I sold $15,000 of one of my favorite companies ever, which is Vici. And in this episode, I'll be explaining why. Now, we also have some other news we'll be getting to. Target, for example, just this morning, slashed guidance again the second time in three weeks. So if you recall, Target just a month ago slashed guidance and they were down 28% in one day. Just one day, they fell 28%. Now this morning they slashed guidance again. They started the day down 6%. They're starting to recover a little bit. Companies so far have not had earnings revisions downwards, but this is starting to happen. Target is now saying that their margins, their operating margins are going from a 5% to a 2%. That is a huge move in projected margins, which hurts the profitability of the company. So we'll be jumping into this news, the market's reaction, and what this means for other companies in your portfolio. Now we also have some Apple news. Apple is still my largest holding in my portfolio. We have some leaks about their VR headset. Surprise, surprise, it's going to be heavily integrated into the Apple ecosystem. And I think more integrated than people realize. So we'll go over some of those integrations that Apple's gonna be doing. And then of course we had the Worldwide Developer Conference This is something that a lot of Apple fanboys and Apple enthusiasts look forward to, where they announced a lot of the software-focused features, like being able to edit and completely remove text messages or iMessages. So now you'll be able to actually undo an iMessage. They also announced a new version of their MacBook Air, which is their best-selling MacBook. So this is an important update, and overall it looks pretty good. So we have all of that Apple news, we have the Target news and retailers, and we have why I sold Vici. So we have a lot to get through in this episode. I think you're going to enjoy it. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Now let's start off with the Vici sale. I want to go ahead and explain this. So in my passive income portfolio, I invest in dividend growth companies, and one of them that I've been the most excited about and the most enthusiastic about over the past year and a half is a real estate investment trust. A fancy way of just saying a publicly traded real estate stock. They have certain rules that other companies don't have, but it's basically all it is. It's a real estate company that you invest in, you buy shares of, and then you get the rent that they get from their tenants. Whenever they get paid rent, they have to pay out 90% of that rent as dividends to you, the shareholder. And in exchange for that, these companies get very favorable tax treatment from the government. So in whole, these companies don't pay a lot in taxes. That's a real estate investment trust. Now, amongst these different real estate investment trusts, there's ones that are in tried and true categories that have been around for a very long time. The one that most dividend investors initially go to is Realty Income Corp. This company has been around for a very long time. It's beaten the market since its IPO. Year over year, it pays a dividend every single month. And that is what this company does. It's the monthly dividend paying company. Now, I held Realty Income Corp for some time and I later sold the company in favor of Vici because I saw better opportunity there. Another company that I held at the same time was Store Capital. This is a little bit younger of a company started by Christopher Volk, who was later removed as CEO. And at one time, even Warren Buffett was invested in this company, but he since sold his stake. Store Capital had a different investment thesis. Rather than focusing on high quality, they focused on high yield. And rather than focusing on a moat, they focused on diversification. Now this company's great, it has its merits, but I saw better opportunity with Vici. The way that I found out about Vici was by visiting Vegas. I went in the summer of 2021, and at the time it was just so busy. There were so many people there. And this is when people were supposed to be scared of COVID. So this was kind of in the midst of it. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of demand here. And when I looked at the various investment opportunities between the different casinos, I came up with the real estate owner that seemed to be buying up all of the Vegas Strip. And it was this company called Vici. They already owned Caesars Palace and they were under agreement to buy the Venetian, which is one of the most high quality places on the Vegas Strip. And that's when I started to research this company and the more I researched it, the more I liked it. Come August 8th of 2021, I came up with a video highlighting my entire bull thesis on Vici, the reason that I'm buying the company. And I went through a number of catalysts, a number of things that I think would cause the fundamentals to improve, and the company's stock price to move up. One of them is that they're growing their AFFO, which is like a company growing their earnings, right? It's almost their free cash flow year over year. And Vici's AFFO was growing at a time that every other real estate companies was shrinking. Every other company was having a difficult time simply collecting rent. Vici was collecting 100% of rent and growing their AFFO by 12% per year. 
That is substantial. Most REITs grow their FFO somewhere in the range of 2 to 4% per year. So 12% is rapid. Vici was diversifying their tenant base. At the time, just last year, Vici was heavily concentrated into Caesars. Caesars made up like 80% of their rents. So they had a problem. Anytime you have one customer, one tenant making up that big of a portion of your revenue and your income, that's problematic because you're heavily reliant on how that customer does as a business. But they were diversifying away from Caesars. They're buying MGM, which would diversify almost their rents in half. So 40% came from MGM, 40% came from Caesars, and then they were doing all different deals outside of that. After these catalysts, it would increase their cash flow to 500 million in cash after paying the dividend. So Vici would be well positioned to continue doing accretive deals. And another thing that Vici was trying to improve at this time, just last year, is that they had a sub investment grade balance sheet, which means that they're not as credit worthy as other REITs and they have a higher cost of capital. Getting loans was more expensive. So that was something else that they were trying to improve was getting that investment grade balance sheet. And then the final catalyst, the final goal for Vici and what this all culminated to was getting positioned for S&P inclusion. This is what I outlined right there as I think the final goal of all of this. So this was my thesis in 2021 summarized. Vici was a high quality company that possessed a large moat because of the uniqueness of their buildings. Vici has a high quality competent management team. I even got the opportunity to speak with the CEO. I asked him, not softballs. I asked him hardball questions, specific questions about risks and concerns and valuation and all different things with the company. And he had extremely competent answers for every single question I threw at him. I also found Vici to be undervalued in absolute terms and relative to its peers. So I found it to be a wide moat company, undervalued, high quality management, and this big list of catalysts, future catalysts to help this stock move up. And overall, I thought the company was a buy. It had a high amount of upside, a low amount of downside. Now, what happened after buying this company? Well, of course, the stock price drifted downwards, more and more and more into the red. And I kept buying this company, even though it was drifting downwards. And that's a difficult thing to do as a YouTuber, because if you buy a stock and you're public about it, and the price goes down at all after purchase, you'll inevitably get a lot of criticism. That's just part of the deal. I received a number of negative comments after Vici started to trade in the red. Vici was a mistake. Glad I didn't get aboard Joseph's hype train. He's been bending over backwards for months to try and justify his bullish stance on the company. The entire market is up and Vici is down. And that commenter at the time one year ago was correct. The entire market was up and Vici was down. But over the past year, a lot of the fundamentals were changing with Vici. If we go through the list of catalysts and just outline them, look at which ones have been done. The acquisition of the Venetian. This was something that was up in the air and you can put a check mark next to that. It's done. Vici now completely owns the Venetian. We have the acquisition of MGM Growth. This is a massive deal and Vici completed this deal. It's done. They own MGM Growth. The business model being recognized by competitors and other institutions. This is part of the original thesis. Well, we have examples that this has already happened. Realty Income Corp saw the merit in Vici's business model, and they're starting to follow suit. They purchased the Boston Harbor, which is a huge casino real estate property, for $1.7 billion. Then we have the investment grade balance sheet. This is a big part of Vici's goal because once you get to that investment grade balance sheet, you get that lower cost of capital. They now have the investment grade balance sheet rating. Then we have the inclusion of Vici into the S&P 500. And they did it because they diversified their revenue stream and their tenant base. They got their balance sheet to investment grade. They were considered and included in the S&P 500 along with a couple other companies. And it caused the stock price to jump over 5% in one day. The final thing that I looked at was the valuation of the company. Because as great as Vici is and as great as the future is for the company, we still have to pay attention to valuations. And the valuation gap between Vici and its pairs closed meaning the delta between the two was no longer there. Vici was not selling at a substantial discount compared to its pairs. So the thesis on this company has really played out perfectly. The stock price did kind of veer downwards for a while, but year to date, it's actually doing quite well. It's up 6.5% year to date, and it's up 19% from its lows. That's not factoring in dividends, which would add another 3% to this performance, because this is a high yielding dividend paying company. And this is at the same time period that the S&P 500 is down 14%, and the QQQ is down 23%. And with that great performance and the Vici stock price moving up, it's no longer trading at a discount relative to its pairs or the rest of the market. In fact, Vici now trades at a price to funds from operation 
of 17. That's in kind of the premium range amongst REITs. Realty Income Corp, which is considered one of the most high quality REITs in the industry, is trading at a cheaper price, a 16.7. And that is simply why I decided to trim my position yesterday and take $15,000 in gains. So June 6 at market open, I sold $15,000 worth of Vici at a price of around $33. So right now I have $12,000 sitting in cash. I've already spent $3,000 of the sale on other things that I'll talk about in a minute. But I wanna go over more of why I'm selling a little bit of Vici, why I'm trimming some of my position. And for reference, this sale brought my position size down from $42,000 to $25,000. So I still have a meaningful amount invested in Vici. I'm still bullish on the company. I still see a bright future ahead of them, but I thought it would be prudent to take some gains while things have moved so much into the positive. And this is difficult to do because the truth is I have a very difficult time selling. I have a very easy time buying. I love doing research on companies, finding undervalued companies, and buying companies when other people don't wanna buy them. And I think that's the heart of a value investor. But I think that one thing a lot of value investors struggle with is selling. When to know, when to sell or trim a position. And this comes because of the advice of major value investors like Warren Buffett. We often hear the advice repeated over and over again from Warren Buffett of why you should just buy and hold. Simply just buy and hold. Never worry about selling. You want to hold companies for life. That's the advice that we get over and over again from Warren Buffett. Well, that's the advice that we hear from Warren Buffett. And it is true that he holds some companies for a very long period of time. He sold Coca-Cola for decades. But what I think doesn't get shared as much about Warren Buffett is that he buys and sells all the time, quite frequently. He's constantly buying companies, trimming positions, and selling entirely out of positions. And if you ever look at a 13F filing from Berkshire Hathaway, literally every single quarter, he's selling out of different companies. Just last quarter, he reduced store capital by 40%. He reduced Royalty Pharma by 82%. He sold entirely out of his Verizon stake, Abvi, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Wells Fargo. This you don't hear about that often, that Warren Buffett is selling different stocks, but Warren Buffett is a value investor. He buys companies that are undervalued when other people don't want anything to do with them, and he sells them when they're overvalued and everyone else loves the companies. And quarter after quarter, he's done the same. He's bought companies, he's held on to companies, but he's also continually making sales. Every single quarter, he is making sales. So I think even with the poster child of buy and hold, it should be noted that he does make sales when his companies move up to premium prices, no matter how high quality the company is. He even sold out a Costco because of concerns about valuation. Warren Buffett, again, is a value investor. He buys companies when other people don't want them. He sells them when other people do want them. And that's what I'm trying to improve on with my portfolio. I'm trying to buy into pessimism when other people don't want the stocks, when other people are mocking you for buying it, saying that it's a horrible purchase, and then selling it when everybody's on board, agreeing that it's a great company and there's no price too high to pay. I can look at an example of a company that I didn't do this with. It was Disney. Disney was a company that I bought at the right time. I really did buy this company at a great time. I did the research, I had a thesis on it, I had the thesis even play out exactly how I said it would, but then I didn't take advantage of it. I didn't take any gains off the table. We can look at the big mistake I made with Disney on this price chart. This is the price chart of Disney, and it shows when I bought the company. Right here I have circled that I'm buying the company, right? I'm praying, I'm hoping that the price is going to go up because I've done my fundamental analysis on it. I've made my entire investment thesis on the company. I put a lot of money in the company. I was buying it in the range of $80 to $120 a share, which was well below the price it was trading at pre-COVID. And I thought that over time with the rapid growth of Disney+, Plus with the Mandalorian and these key series being put on it, that investors would soon turn bullish on the company. Well, guess what? They did. They did soon turn bullish on the company, and the stock price rocketed up from $120 a share up to almost $200 a share. And guess what I did? I said, I'm a buy and hold investor. I'm not going to take any profits at all. And at the time, I felt great. But I was ignoring something important at this time. Disney was trading at a premium valuation, at a pretty high valuation, plus investor mood was very high on the company. Sentiment and enthusiasm was at an all-time high. I had the perfect combination to sell to an enthusiastic crowd of investors at very high prices and make around $10,000 of gains in the process. But what I did was I just held onto my shares. 
All those paper gains vanished away over the coming months, and now Disney's trading at next to $100 a share, anywhere from $100 to $110. It's below my cost basis. So now I'm stuck back into this hoping category that Disney will once again have investors turn bullish and get enthusiastic, and I can take advantage of that enthusiasm once again. But this opportunity here is gone. I had the perfect opportunity to take some off the table, to lock in a lot of gains off of a company that my thesis originally played out in, and I didn't do that. See, the truth is selling is difficult. It's easy to buy companies and to look for companies that are undervalued, but knowing when to sell them is difficult. And for now on, when I see a company, even a high quality company, trade at a premium valuation and my thesis plays out on the company, I'll be looking at either selling or trimming the position to take some gains. One of the phrases we hear about frequently as investors is it's not a loss until you sell. If the company moves down on price and you're in the red, you really haven't lost any money until you realize it by selling the company. I have companies that are new investments that I'm in the red right now that I don't really consider them a loss because I haven't sold them. I still hold these companies. The same thing applies to gains. You really don't have a gain until you sell. The stock price moving up is one thing, but it can move down if you don't take any of those gains. So in summary, that's why I trimmed my Vici position by $15,000. Even though the company has a bright future and the fundamentals are as great as ever, the valuation gap, the undervaluedness of the company is gone. That gap is closed and it now trades at a bit of a premium. And for me personally, I think that's a good time to take some gains. When I look at this trade, this is what it looks like overall. Since purchase, the Dow Jones is down 4.46%. The S&P 500 is down 3.8%. The NASDAQ is down 12.8%. And Vici, between its dividends, capital appreciation, and the acquisition of MGM Growth, which I also owned, is up a combined 27.3%. That is a total gain of the time of sale of $8,200. Now, what am I doing with the $15,000 from this sale? Well, let me go over that real quick. Anytime I don't have an immediate place to put money, I'll build up my SCHD holding. This is kind of like a cash position. I can just sip money here. It diversifies it automatically into 100 high quality dividend paying companies. And I'll continue to build up this position anytime that I don't have an active bet that I want to put a lot of money into. So this way I don't feel pressured to dump my money from one sale into a different company. But I also have some companies that I am bullish on right now. A few of them are in the restaurant category, and these are companies that nobody wants anything to do with. This is buying into pessimism. Starbucks has unionization, they have problems with China, they have problems with their leadership and their CEO, they have all sorts of problems that have driven down investor sentiment to all-time lows. The stock price for Starbucks is down 29% year to date, and over the past five years, it's only up 27%. It trades right now at $79, and its all-time high is around 120. So this is another instance that feels familiar. I'm trying to buy from pessimism with Starbucks. And while we have all these negative things going on, all this negative stuff in the news, people lose track of the fact that Starbucks is still a high-quality brand. People love the company. They go there routinely every single day. They serve a product that's never going out of style. It still has secular growth and a great balance sheet, and it produces mass amount of free cash flows, and it pays almost a 3% dividend yield. This is a high quality company trading at a historically low valuation, and I'm okay holding this company through the red for a long period of time, continuing to dollar cost average in it. Because I think that one day, again, investors will turn bullish on the company, sentiment will improve, and the mood of the investors will push the price up to new all-time highs. And in the meantime, I'll continue to dollar cost average and patiently await for that to happen. So I'll keep you updated on what I do with this cash, but I am gonna be spending it over the next month or so. Now, if you wanna see more of this type of stuff in the future, if you wanna see what I'm doing with my portfolios, I'm one of the few people on YouTube in content creation that shares my portfolios every single week completely transparently. The progress of it, the gains and losses, the trades that I'm doing and the research, all for free every single week. All you have to do is subscribe to the channel. Now let's go ahead and move on to the Target news and the struggle with retailers. Before we jump into that, I do have some exciting news. We have a new sponsor of the Joseph Carlson Show, which is FTX US. Now, I know this is shocking. I've done this show for nearly three years. And I've really done almost no sponsorships over that time. And I finally decided to take on a sponsorship because I actually trust them and I think that their platform's pretty amazing. So let me tell you about the platform a little bit and what I plan on doing with it. This is FTX US, which is one of the world's largest US regulated crypto exchanges. Millions of people every day use FTX to buy and sell top cryptocurrencies and NFTs with no fees. Now, another thing I like about FTX and the reason that I had them sponsor the channel is because they're well backed. This is a stable 
company. They have huge brand partnerships with people like Tom Brady, Kevin O'Leary, Steph Curry. They even have Tom Brady investing in the company. And the founder of the company seems like a decent guy and he is incredibly rich. His name's Sam Bankman-Fried. He has a reported $11.6 billion net worth as of right now. He said that he's gonna give away 99% of it to charity and he's already started foundations. And the incredible thing here is that he's 30 years old. So this is a young guy, he's younger than me, and he's worth $11.6 billion, which is pretty incredible. Now you might be saying, all right, FTX is a great platform, it has financial backing, it's well liked by traders and cryptocurrency, but Joseph, you're not a cryptocurrency guy. You don't own this type of stuff. And that's true, I've never really been big into cryptocurrencies. But what most people aren't aware of right now is that FTX is expanding beyond cryptocurrencies. They're going into stocks, and that's what caught my attention. Now FTX is most known for their cryptocurrency exchange and all their cryptocurrency tools, but what they're doing is they're moving into stocks. And this is really what I find interesting. Now this is currently in beta, so if you sign up right now, it will have beta access. They currently have hundreds of people testing it and they're gonna be releasing it more widely soon. Now, I got beta access to this and it's pretty cool. It's buy and sell anytime, there's no commissions. They're not accepting any payment for order flow, which I think is all good things. But what I plan on doing is something very specific on this stock trading portion of FTX. You can see that I have three shares of Amazon. I'm gonna slowly be buying more and more Amazon shares until I get to 100 shares of Amazon. So it'll take some time to get there, but the reason that I'm looking to get to 100 shares of Amazon is because 100 shares is where it unlocks the ability to run options. And what I plan on doing with Amazon is turning this non-dividend paying stock into an income generating stock. And I'm gonna be doing that by selling covered call options. So. I've never done that before. I've never done any type of options. I've never sold any covered calls before, but I'm gonna learn how to do it. So if you wanna follow along with this, sign up for account yourself. I put a link in the description of this video, as well as in the pinned comment. It's completely free. There's no strings attached. It took me literally two minutes to sign up and you can follow along with this. Once I get to 100 shares and FTX builds out their options portion, I'm gonna be learning how to do covered call options and turn Amazon into an income generating asset where I earn income every single month. Now, the majority of this is gonna be on the Joseph Carlson After Hours channel. So if you wanna follow along with this whole process in more detail and you're interested in learning how to do covered call options, Make sure you subscribe to the Joseph Carlson After Hours channel because that's where I'll have most of that content. But I'm excited to be doing this because I've been told by many people for a long period of time that I should be selling covered calls in my stocks and this will allow me to finally do it. Now in terms of my current portfolio and strategy, nothing is changing with this. So I'm gonna be learning how to sell covered call options on the FTX platform, but nothing's gonna be changing with my passive income portfolio. All right, now moving on, let's jump into some news. We have the headline news today that Target is warning of weaker profits as it faces overstuffed, oversupplied stores with the stuff they no longer need. So basically, Target forecasted their demand and the items they'd need in their stores incorrectly. What they purchased for their customers was a bunch of hard goods, things like patio furniture, outdoor stuff, right as the customer was transitioning more to soft goods, things like clothing and groceries and soon to be school supplies. So Target purchased a bunch of the wrong stuff for their customer at the wrong time. That creates a huge problem. They say that big retailers like Target benefited over the past two years from the pandemic rush to buy patio furniture, laptops, home decor, and shoppers were buoyed by savings of the government stimulus checks. Now many of those same shoppers are grappling with the swift reversal of buying behavior, with consumers spending less on goods in favors of services and necessities such as food and fuel. So people are now going on vacation, they're going to travel, they're going to restaurants, they're not going to Target quite as much. Target and other retailers are seeing a lot less traffic than they did last year. And Target's forecasting on this subject has been terrible. Just two weeks after reporting lower than expected profits, Target said Tuesday, which is today, it will further reduce some of its profit estimates for the year because it will more quickly unload the excess inventory in the current quarter. So they could have tried to keep their margins high and they just sell these items more slowly. The problem with that is that Targets have limited space for warehouse. And in order to get their space filled for all their back to school goods, they need to get rid of the current goods they have in there. To get rid of them quicker, they have to discount them. When they discount them, that lowers their operating margins. And they're expected to have their operating margins go down from 5% down to 2%. 
This is something that I literally warned about just a week ago in my past episode. I said the market will fall another 20%. And granted, this is a little bit of a clickbait title. The purpose of this video is not a prediction that the market would fall 20% but it was rather what is priced into the market. Right now, the market is pricing in that companies will not have earnings revisions lower. And I said that if companies have lowered earnings revisions for 2022, that could potentially drop the market another 20%. So this isn't a prediction as much as what is priced in and what isn't priced in. Right now, companies are not priced in to have their earnings revised lower. And that is precisely what's happening with Target. Their earnings per share revisions upwards are zero. No analyst is revising their earnings upwards, but 21 have revised their earnings downward. So every single analyst has done another earnings revision downward for Target, saying the company is going to be less profitable this year. You can see this play out visually right here. All the EPS projections are going down. And like we learned with the previous episode, the price to earnings basis on a Ford multiple the E part of that is the forward earnings. If that gets revised downwards, it makes the company more expensive. So typically the price will follow downwards. Now there's some companies that have avoided this. Salesforce, for instance, has said that they're actually gonna be more profitable. So they're a business to business company. They're not trying to juggle consumer behavior. So they might have an easier time gauging demand, but Salesforce is increasing their earnings estimates. Target and other retailers are likely to lower theirs. And amongst retail companies, this isn't a problem that just Target is facing. Trying to predict the future behavior of consumers is very difficult for investors and executives of these companies. At Walmart's annual shareholder meeting last week, the executive said that around 20% of the elevated inventory consists of items a company wishes they didn't have. So 20% of their stuff in inventory, they're just saying, well, darn, we, we don't need this. We're not able to sell it. So it's literally going to sit here and take up valuable space for the rest of the year as we try to slowly get rid of it. And they're saying that it's going to take around at least the next couple of quarters to get back to where they want to be. So Right now, these retailers are trying to juggle this varying demand and this radical consumer shift in behavior of what they're purchasing. And it's been really difficult to do. Target has struggled with it, Walmart has, Amazon has to a big degree as well. I think the one that's handled it best is probably Costco. So this is the second time in three weeks that Target has tried to take down the rest of the stock market. And this time investors are kind of brushing it off. They're just saying, all right, Target has these issues, maybe retailers do, but other than that, we're not really worried about it. So I think investors are kind of getting over the short-term problems with these companies. And in terms of my holding of Target, I'm still in the green only because I've held this company for like three years. I initially invested just $1,000 into it, and it's done really well over that period of time. But it has given up a lot of its gains. So even though I'm heavily in the green on this company, I'm not going to be selling it right now. Target has traded both at a very enthusiastic PE ratio of above 20, which was probably the optimal time to take some gains in this company, now down to the very pessimistic PE ratio of 11. So I'm not going to be selling it right now. Now, Moving on, we have some big news out of Apple. We know that Apple has been working on a VR headset for some time. It's always been something that we're just hearing rumors and leaks from, but we know this project is real and Apple is getting closer and closer to releasing it. And we just got another set of leaks about this project. This illustrates how heavily integrated this project is going to be, meaning that Apple never builds one separate device that kind of just operates on its own. Every single device they have is heavily integrated into their ecosystem. That is the Apple moat. And even though Morningstar thinks that Apple has a narrow moat, I think it has one of the widest moats in the market. And I think that's the reason that Warren Buffett likes the company. The moat is massive. I don't see anyone competing with their moat. And this new VR headset, I really think only expands that moat. They say that Apple is aiming to make user interface elements like body tracking, hand tracking, gestures, hand-based typing, and Siri access automatically embedded inside third-party apps. Just like the iPhone elements, such as the keyboard, they get automatically integrated into iOS app. So there you hear the integration word twice. They're integrating Siri into this platform. And further on, we see more talk about integration. They say that while third-party apps are a key ingredient for this project, Apple is also planning a slew of its own apps. That includes a VR version of FaceTime. So they're making a virtual reality version of FaceTime that can replicate your face's movements in a Memoji format. Then they have a new VR version of Maps, and ROS variant of the core apps like notes and calendars. Also in the works is a way for the headset to extend 
a max display, bringing it into 3D. So they're making a VR version of basically every other tool and app and platform that they currently have. And then their integration doesn't stop there. They say, moreover, the company is leveraging its entertainment arm and acquisitions like NextVR to build 3D versions of its content. Don't be surprised to eventually see virtual reality iterations of Apple TV Plus shows and Fitness Plus workouts. Apple's increased foray into sports is also not a coincidence, and I'd expect that to tie in nicely as well. So Apple is not planning on having this VR headset be a standalone device that is unlinked from their ecosystem. Every single aspect of this will be linked to their ecosystem, just as the iPad, the MacBook, and the iPhone is. And that has been my long-term bull thesis for Apple. Every single feature and product like the VR headset, the Apple car, or even new little features on your iPhone are all carefully calculated to further lock you into their ecosystem, widening their moat over time. Now, they also introduced a lot of features like the ability to edit and remove text messages. This feature alone, the ability to undo send on iMessage, I think will end up saving quite a few relationships. They also introduced another MacBook Air. This is one of their bigger products. It actually makes up the majority of their MacBook sales. And I see why. It's basically a very powerful, ultra thin MacBook that has almost the same specs as the MacBook Pro, and it's on a very small frame. It's very light, easy to use. So it doesn't surprise me that this makes up for the most sales. Now, after they announced a bunch of different features from notification grouping to iMessages to mail, they also announced, I think, one of the biggest features, which is Apple finally stepping into buy now, pay later. And this is something that I've been predicting for a long time. When people ask me, what is your favorite FinTech company? My answer by default is Apple. I think it is the most powerful fintech company. And people think that's a coy response or they think I'm joking a little bit, but I'm not. Apple has the ability to turn entire companies into a feature. And Apple's latest fintech move is this buy now pay later feature. Basically all they're doing is breaking this down into four payments instead of one. So you pay it off over six weeks, every two weeks with the first payment at the time of purchase. So you have the first 25% due today, then every two weeks you have another 25% due, and that's also with no interest assuming you pay on time. Now I haven't invested in a lot of other fintech companies specifically because I think most of them compete with Apple, and I think that's a very difficult company to compete with. You have the example of a firm. This is basically a buy now pay later company, and it's down 75% just year to date. And this news from Apple is not great at all for a firm. Apple Pay is widely popular, already being used by millions of people, and if giving the choice of paying later with a firm or a separate service, or just using Apple Pay, I have to assume the vast majority of people would pick Apple Pay. So this shows the power of them leveraging their current ecosystem to continue to grow into other businesses. Apple has a knack for turning other startup companies into simply small features of the Apple ecosystem. And then at this development conference, probably the biggest feature that Apple announced was the additional improvements on the M1 chip into the M2 chip. So they came out with another iteration of their already incredibly powerful chip called the M2 chip. And you can see it pictured there, it's a little bit bigger. Now you can dive into this in more detail on the tech channels, but it's basically just a better chip all around. It has better efficiency cores and it's more powerful. It has a 35% faster GPU and 50% more memory bandwidth. And this is another thing that I think gets discounted in Apple's stock. They are leaps and bounds ahead of their competitors with chip making. So as of right now, my thoughts really haven't changed on Apple. I'm in the green by around $15,000 on this holding. Apple currently trades at $147 a share. They have their earnings report later this month. And I'm just gonna to continue to hold this company because at a 22 PE ratio, I don't think you're paying much of a premium to hold an incredibly premium company. So as of right now, Apple, in my opinion, is not a sell or a buy, I'm simply holding. So that's all for this episode. I'll have more updates out this week. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and I'll catch you in the next one.